Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program on antibiotic resistance and infection control. Antimicrobial resistance is a public health threat of enormous importance. And the serious and real risk is that by 2030, we'll be back in a pre-antibiotic era. And if you think that's just scaremongering, watch on. Now let me introduce our panel to you. John Bell is Vice President of the International Pharmaceutical Federation and past President of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia and the Australian College of Pharmacy Practice. Welcome, John. Glad you had the time to come. Thank you, Norman. Marilyn Cruikshank is a registered nurse who works in safety and quality. Welcome, Marilyn. Thank you. Marilyn's currently leading the National Healthcare Associated Infection Program with the Australian Commission on Self Safety and Health Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Margaret Duguid is a pharmaceutical advisor at the Australian Commission also. Margaret is involved in leading and coordinating improvements in the safe use of medicines. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Margaret also works, and you'll hear more about this later, on antimicrobial stewardship and co-edited the Commission's publication, Antimicrobial Stewardship in Australian Hospitals. Gary Franks is a general practitioner in Illawong. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, Norman. Gary is a consultant at the National Prescribing Service and was a GP member of the expert group guiding the anti antibiotic therapeutic guidelines, versions 13 and 14. Tom Gottlieb is a specialist in microbiology and infectious diseases. Welcome, Tom. Tom is currently president of the Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases, the president-elect of the Australian Society for Antimicrobials, and is on the executive of the Australian Group on Antimicrobial Resistance. So welcome to you all, and an august and authoritative panel. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I mean, Tom, if you look at the graph here, there's, I mean, we've had a remarkable effect from antibiotics. They've been an astounding medical technology. They're the true miracle drugs, and no other, anti, uh, no other drugs have had such a profound effect on uh, diseases in the 20th century. And you can see on that graph that in the 1940s and so on, when these drugs were introduced, they reduced morbidity and mortality. But our risk is that we're going to go back to that era, as you've already mentioned, when we lose a lot of these antibiotics. And if so what's that blip at the end of the graph there? The blip at the end of the graph there is HIV and the mortality associated with HIV, but luckily a lot of companies have gone into HIV drug production um, and that blip has gone down again with better antiretroviral medications. But uh, the sad thing is those companies are no longer producing antibiotics. And that's the key here, no sooner is an antibiotic produced, I mean how quick is it that you get resistance appearing after a new antibiotic coming Usually out? you can see it worldwide within about a decade. I mean, resistance occurs very quickly after antibiotics are used, but when you're on a flat curve of an exponential curve, you don't really see it from epidemiological point of view. It's only after a while that you start seeing it, and by then it's often too late. So what is the extent to, to which, you know, what's the number needed to treat to get resistance? Do we know that? I mean, for example, you've got a patient coming in with a UTI, you give them an antibiotic. Of 100 patients being treated with a UTI, the antibiotic, to how many of them do we know will develop resistance as a result of the antibiotic prescription? You can't, the point is that the, all bacteria potentially possess the mechanism for resistance. In any population of bacteria, there's already a, a percentage of bacteria so can, that are inherently resistant. you can resistant. select for resistance. You select for resistance. That resistance is already there to some extent, but it hasn't been produced to any large number. As we use antibiotics, we allow those resistant organisms to come to the fore. So the extent to which we're talking about a population-based problem or one in our individual patients. I mean, that's what I'm trying to get at. Should, you, should your hand be quivering over the prescription pad that five days from now, seven days from now, um, this person's got a 50% chance of having um, um, a, the growth of a resistant population of bacteria? No, for the specific infection you're treating, you can be confident that your antibiotics are going to work, but that person's gut flora will be changed within a number of days, and what you'll see is resistant flora, often of a different species, colonizing that patient's gut. And some of those organisms will have already resistance factors which can spread to other bacteria. So how does the resistance spread? You've got phages, you've got the viruses that infect bacteria that can carry resistance between different species of bacteria. How else? Well, a lot of bacteria pr 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 have plasmids, and these plasmids collect resistance factors and congregate them, and these plasmids can move from 
uh, mother to daughter, but they can also move horizontally to other species of organisms very quickly. Bacteria spread resistance very promiscuously. So here's the scary graph. This is the, the extent to which new antibiotics are being produced over time. And I mean, and this is a, this is the truly frightening. This is this is the frightening scenario here. Yes, we had a, a lot of new antibiotics in the 1950s and 60s, but when you look at that graph, really there have been two new classes of antibiotics in at the end of the 20th century, and both of those classes are very narrow in their capacity, and resistance to both of these have already become well established. So what, what we're looking there is that that red box is the front line against resistance. Well, these are the new antibiotics. They're often extremely expensive, and they're not going to last us long term. And the issue is that if you're not producing new antibiotics, you've got to preserve your old ones. We've got to find means of controlling the spread of antimicrobial resistance. Some of that is through control, controlling antimicrobial use, but also once you've already got resistance, controlling the spread. And that could be through in hospitals with better infection control, for example, or better programs about antimicrobial use. Tell me the story of Greece. I mean, Greece is in the news at the moment, but it's also got a bad story with antibiotic resistance. Yes. Look, this is a, an example where a particular resistance has occurred to our last line antibiotic. These are called carbapenem antibiotics, and really they're beta-lactam antibiotics that cover the broadest uh, spectrum of bacteria. And you can see that within a decade in Greek hospitals, you've gone from zero percentage resistance in Klebsiella, which is a very common gut organism, to 80% in Greek hospitals. And that's a clear indictment of antimicrobial prescribing, but also of hospital infection control. Because once this organism appears in your hospital, if you can't contain it, it'll spread elsewhere. And that's what, exactly what's happened. So, I mean, this could apply to a general practice or a hospital. You've done studies of um, tourniquets. Yes, we looked at tourniquets in our hospitals just to make a point to our administration about uh, how hospitals need to be cleaned better. But the example of the tourniquets was that these tourniquets were sitting in the wards being used by a lot of the RMOs and, and going from patient to patient to patient. And when you actually tested them, 20% of our tourniquets had either MRSA or VRE already sitting on that tourniquet. And that's just environmental colonization. But the point is that the tourniquet itself is not to blame, it's the cleaning of the environment that allows these organisms to remain there and potentially spread. And you've got another example here of uh, another resistance because you, you, you could say with the Greek story, well, what, what does that matter? I mean, it's Greece, you know, it's not going to happen here. But, you've, but people travel. Exactly. So I think the point with the Greek one was this was Greek hospitals and failures there. But here's an example of a very similar organism. Here, actually, it's a, a, it's a particular enzyme that, again, dis destroys all penicillin-like or beta-lactam antibiotics and a whole lot of others as well. And this resistance emerged in the community in New Delhi, but in India and Pakistan, and rapidly spread to England. And within two years, from 2009 to 2011, has spread worldwide. So it's come and to Australia as well. It has come to Australia as well. And the so point, oh, sorry. poor practices somewhere else. Can poor practices somewhere else. else. And here this organism survives in water, in seepage and sewage. So this is a community problem. But the problem really is that a lot of people colonised, they're never going to get sick, sick with this organism. But when they do develop their urinary tract infection or sepsis, and that person presents to your hospital, you wouldn't realise you've got this resistance until you test that patient and get results 48 hours later. So you is are resistant organisms more virulent or it's more that you miss the fact that they're resistant? Some or resistant organisms can also have other virulence factors, like certain staphs. But in this situation, this organism is not more virulent in itself. It's just that we don't anticipate that we've got this, we treat the patient with the wrong antibiotics, or we may have no antibiotics left in the situation. And Margaret, th there are stats showing that people die more frequently with resistant organisms. They're, they're more likely to die. Yes, yes. There are, there are studies that have shown it's more likely to, twice as likely to die from a, an infection with a, an, a, a resistant organism. And tell me the E. coli story now and, and that spread. The E. coli... The third generation cephalosporins. Oh, the third generation cephalosporins. Well, these are actually even more common. These are called ESBLs. E. coli. And this, this graph shows a change in five years in Europe, both in E. coli and Klebsiella. 
and you can tell by the colors that green is less than 5% resistance, but red or orange is to 20 to 50 percent resistance and you can see how rapidly these are bloodstream infections in Europe and you can see how rapidly resistance has emerged and again it's an index of both those things use and infection control but the point there is that often the Scandinavian countries the countries to the north have got much lower rates of resistance and yet when you look at statistics on mortality or morbidity with these infections those patients in Scandinavia are not dying anymore by not using antibiotics to the same extent. So those are low antibiotic prevalence countries with low resistance. Exactly. So it, it just... And not with, an, with no corresponding increase in mortality because they're dying because of lack of antibiotics. Exactly. So our antibiotic use can often be out of proportion to need. And what about the Australian situation? Well, Australia in some situations has been lucky. We've had much better control of agricultural use of antibiotics but that doesn't protect us. But in certain situations, we're starting to see changes. This graph shows the rise of community MRSA, which is a nasty, potentially very virulent organism that we're seeing, particularly in rural areas and in indigenous areas. And the point to make here is you can see the trend from 2000 to 2008 in some studies in Australia. But if you were to look in 1990 and that graph would be zero. You wouldn't get community MRSA anywhere in Australia pretty well. There were some exceptions. But now there's an inexorable rise upwards, and we don't know where it will end. Will it be 50%? Uh, certainly in the United States now, 70% of patients presenting to emergency departments with staph infections have community MRSA. Which means, Gary, that <coughs> you, know, you can't be c complacent about your cuffs or tourniquets in a general practice anymore. Absolutely not. And in fact, beyond that is the need for us to be very diligent on using narrow spectrum antibiotics for skin and soft tissue infections, which are often caused by uh, staphylococcus, of course, and not the use of cephalosporins, which is often the case. So do we know the extent to which community MRSA is caused by poor prescribing in general practice? We know that it has evolved through antibiotic, poor antibiotic use and certain areas we can actually document how it's been used it's been related to say cephalosporin use but once that clone is established clones of bacteria spread unrelated so uh, the antibiotics still maintain a pressure on use but once it's escaped there are other dynamics in place as well so you could say that in Greece because they can't afford carbapenem anymore um, does that mean you're going to see that graph reversing? That graph may tone down a bit and go away if they can control their antibiotic use, but sadly, a lot of those resistance factors will remain in those organisms or in a subset of those organisms. And the minute you reintroduce antibiotics of a class or a similar class... They'll surge back. They'll research, uh, surge back. Because I thought it was expensive for an organism to carry that resistance, that their natural, unresistant, non-resistant state was the most energy-conserving. It's, it's probably a bit of a myth. It depends on some organisms. In certain TB strains, it may be the case. But in most of our bacteria, in fact, acquiring antibiotic resistance has had very little cost to their virulence. To what extent, John, do uh, pharmacists use therapeutic guidelines? Well, it's a mandatory text in, in community pharmacy, Norman. Um, I guess we don't use the, the book, though, as much as we should. Um, one of the reasons, I guess, is that we're often, most often, not privy to the diagnosis, uh, the type of infection, the type of condition the patient has. We can assume most often if someone comes in coughing and spluttering, that's a respiratory tract infection. Um, uh, otherwise, if they walk in uncomfortably, maybe we can presume it's a UTI. Uh, but there are hints, of course, in, in the prescription that we're presented with. Uh, in hospitals, there's, I think, enormous collaboration between pharmacy and medicine, the doctors and the pharmacists there. Not as much on issues like this uh, in the community. Is there I any? Uh, there's some, but, but very little, I think. It, it would be rare for a, a general practitioner, I, I should ask Gary this as well, a uh, general practitioner to refer to his or her local pharmacist for advice as to which antibiotic to use. The, the question that's come in is from Jill Fletcher, the manager of Berry Hospital General Services, who has the recent South Australian cleaning guidelines and wants to know what place cleaning standards have in assisting with outsmarting bacteria in the hospital with regard to antibiotic resistance. Marilyn, that's a question for you. Mm. Look, cleaning is very, very important because, um, as Tom has said um, uh, previously, that um, you know antibiotics uh, cause uh, resistance in different organisms, but and that's in a particular patient. But that patient then can uh, 
transfer that um, multi-resistant organism to the surroundings. So if um, hospital surfaces and surroundings aren't cleaned adequately, then other patients can either um, become infected with those multi-resistant organisms by touching those surfaces, or healthcare workers can transfer them from one patient to another around the, around, around the area. So another problem is too that you can't tell by looking at a surface whether there are multi-resistant organisms on it. So we really need to have you know, well-trained um, staff who can do the cleaning. We need to have Which them. I presume is not often the case. Well, no, it, it, it often isn't because often there's a, a large turnover. You get contract cleaners in who can think they can do it. Yes, and we have a, a large turnover, so we need to have well-trained cleaners who stay. And does it matter what they use to clean with? Cause do they ever get resistant to disinfection, d disinfectants? Well, that's an interesting that's an interesting question, and uh, but usually cleaning with um, detergents. But you're not going to answer it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, cl usually cleaning with um, detergents and cleaning thoroughly, and then disinfecting with with bleach or some other sort of disinfectant is adequate. Yeah. Right. Can, can, I, can I ask Norman, uh, Marilyn, in, in the community setting, in the home, mm. um, we we see a promotion of lots mm. of uh, antibacterial disinfectant uh, mm. cloths and wipes and and solutions and so on, mm. um, these are not really necessary, are they? They're not necessary, no. Detergent and soap is the best product to be cleaning mm. with. Mm. So the, the overuse of, of uh, chemical uh, antibacterials and so forth could, could actually exacerbate the problem? Absolutely. That can also add to, add to the problem of um, antimicrobial resistance as mm. well. Yes. Margaret, what, do we know the extent of inappropriate prescribing? Well, uh, we certainly know that um, in hospitals, um, probably around 50% of um, prescribing could be inappropriate. 50%? Mm, up to so 50%. Is that, Certainly the studies have is shown that. that. omission, commission? What's the story here? Um, well, this is mainly if we look at it um, against um, guidelines. If we look at uh, prescribing against guidelines, it's pretty poor. So not necessary, wrong antibiotic, wrong duration. Yes. We'll come to all that yep. in, a, in, a, yep. in a minute. Tom, Clostridium difficile. They say in Britain there's 250,000 premature deaths due to Clostridium difficile in hospitals a year. I mean, that's an enormous number. Yeah, Clostridium difficile is an organism that really colonises surfaces and it's extremely difficult to get rid of. And in the UK, they had an outbreak of a very toxic strains, which we've been very lucky that we haven't had in Australia to date in a, to any large extent. I thought we had some in Western Australia, didn't we? We had some actually in Sydney and in Melbourne in the last two years, but they haven't really got out to any degree. I think what happened in the UK is that they had, at that time, poor infection control and it got into nursing homes, into the really vulnerable. But England's got their act together. To some extent, they've improved their uh, prescribing guidelines, their infection control, and ahead of us, I think. So we're an accident still waiting to happen, as far as that goes. What's the role of surveillance, Margaret? Um, surveillance in terms well, of Well, we've got the National Antimicrobial Utilisation Surveillance Programme. Sure. Uh, well, the, uh, the National um, uh, Antibiotic Usage Surveillance Programme uh, collects data from uh, about 50% of uh, principal referral hospitals in Australia. And so it doesn't involve country hospitals? It, um, if you live in South Australia, they collect data, and also in Queensland, they collect data from the uh, from most hospitals. So but you're looking the, at those are infections and comparing it to the antibiotic use. Is that what's happening? Uh, no, there is. It depends on what, what is used at the hospital. They may use that data to um, to compare against their um, susceptibility data, um, but the. Um, Generally, um, that data at this point in time, certainly national data, is not related to uh, resistance data. We don't have a comparison. Gary, give me the antibiotic creed, because this really um, will frame the rest of our discussion. It's a profound statement. It'll, it'll be on the screen, and it's probably one that most GPs have either not seen or uh, cannot remember seeing, and it's an acronym, Mind Me, Micro Microbiology Guides Therapy, wherever possible. Indications should be evidence-based, narrow spectrum required, dosage appropriate to the site and type of infection, minimise duration of therapy and ensure monotherapy in most situations. Well, let's unpack that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So microbiology guides therapy. So does that mean swabs, blood cultures, 
etc. in general practice? Obviously in general practice it's more limited than in a hospital setting but there's a, a lot of room for microurines to be tested, swabs of wounds, uh, throat swabs uh, appropriate on occasions, uh, sputum cultures can be useful. So it's limited but uh, compared to the hospital obviously less so but it can guide our therapy and make it directed therapy a few days later. Tom, what is the role for empirical therapy? And I'm assuming when we're talking about empirical therapy is that you're giving treatment without knowing what the diagnosis is, but on a hunch, you know that somebody's sick and you suspect it's a bacterial infection. Is that what we're talking about here? Yes. And there's always a role for it because the beauty of antibiotics is that they save lives. And if you've got patients with sepsis, there's no time to wait for the diagnosis you want to treat appropriately. But still, it's got to collate with what the likely diagnosis is. If you're dealing with meningococcal sepsis, it's different to someone with pneumonia. And there are very good guidelines, in the therapeutic guidelines, for example, which still give you a good um, direction to empiric therapy. But it's driven by the idea that you don't know what the pathogen is. And the problem with antimicrobial resistance is, again, 10, 20 years ago, you could predict that you could give certain antibiotics and get away with it. What we're facing in the near future is patients, young people coming with pyelonephritis and you might be getting wrong 20% of the time. That's a worry. So empirical therapy doesn't get you out of jail in terms of doing the microbial test? No. You still want, in, a, in that sort of emergency setting, you want a blood culture. But if, if it's not an emergency setting, where on the other hand you're still pretty convinced you need anti uh, antibiotics, well, for example, taking someone with a um, staphylococcal infection, you really want to know if it's an MRSA or not. You really want to take that uh, pus specimen and send it off. You don't want to put it in a bin. Let's go. So, uh, but if you're a GP and you've got somebody who's septic with funny spots and you think it's meningococcal septicemia, you wouldn't hang around? No, that antibiotic should have hit five minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. so there are exceptions to, to, to this rule. Absolutely. I think what we want to say about antibiocrabials, we want to preserve them so we can use them for the patients that need them. Uh, we've got a question from Shepparton, a general practitioner wanting to know what are the one or two things a GP should do to reduce the, the, the spread of antibiotic resistance. Gary? I think that comes in that antimicrobial creed and, uh, and if I can refer back to that, uh, indication should be evidence based. We have good evidence in therapeutic guidelines that can be on all of our desktops minimised and referred to daily throughout the day. And really wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. Therapeutic guidelines gives us this knowledge, it's up to the GPs to wisely apply that. Uh, we can use narrow spectrum antibiotics, uh, tonsillitis, bacterial tonsillitis, often broad spectrum antibiotics I witness being prescribed for this like amoxicillin when phenoxymethyl penicillin BD is the drug of choice, a narrow spectrum antibiotic. Dosage appropriate uh, to the site and type of infection. We often, I often see wound infections being treated with cephalosporins and when flucloxacillin is the standard guideline recommended when patients are not allergic to penicillin. So, so I mean, I would imagine that for most GPs, the first thing in their mind when they prescribe is actually resistance, either consciously or unconsciously. And presumably that's the reason why there's such vast prescribing of amoxicillin clavulanic acid. And, but what you're saying is that's the wrong thing to do. In certain infections, that's the wrong thing to do. We should be guiding our prescribing on evidence to and try then, and help and the whole And then you kind of think, well, let's just blast this bloody infection to smithereens and I'm going to give, you know, the duo 40, you know, hit them between the eyes with it. I want to get rid of this. I want to level the landscape here. Well, we have a right to prescribe. We also have a responsibility and there are risks. And, uh, so, so talk to me about dosage. Is it the lowest possible dose? When we can, the lowest possible dose for the shortest duration of time is appropriate for certain infections. Now, that's not appropriate for the patient who's septic. But for a urinary tract infection, for a symptomatic woman, where we have some evidence that clinically they may have a urinary tract infection, again, I anecdotally observe uh, a prescription of cephalosporin for uh, a weekend or repeat when it's, the guidelines say five days BD is so enough. Tom, what happens when you give too high a dose for too long, or too high a dose, that's one issue, or too long, what happens? The too high a dose doesn't worry me that much because you're, you're really killing the bacteria and the only problem with a high dose is that you might have more intolerance or more side effects. But it's the duration of therapy that's a concern because the more you use antimicrobials, the more resistance you will see. It's Darwinian.
and we really have an onus on us to reduce the duration of therapy. And a lot of things that have been always said uh, in myth mythologically that you if must you use 10, 14 days aren't wrong. You can use five days. And, and uh, Tom and, and Gary, I mean, that's something that pharmacists have, have I guess, reinforced for for decades that you must finish the course of antibiotics and, and the repeat if the doctor's ordered a repeat. Um, and um, I mean, you've, you've suggested maybe a shorter course for UTI, maybe three days I think is, is appropriate uh, for trimethoprim and, and yet seven day course is almost always prescribed and certainly we pharmacists have, have had it inculcated that we must reinforce that message. So you're telling us that's not quite right. It's communication to the patient and also to the pharmacist. But also we need to be careful in our antibiotic prescribing when we're using electronic prescribing that we don't just click on the default which has a repeat. We need to remove that and be very careful because patients often don't use it then and they save it for another time, of course. I think it's the beauty of evidence that we, you know, things change over time and if the evidence comes out that you don't need to use those long durations, we should be ready to adapt. We know that meningococcal meningitis needs three days of therapy. Often people get 14 days. And what about prophylactic therapy? You know, the surgical situation, there's people watching this who are GP surgeons and you know, they've, got, they've got guidelines on prophylactic antibiotics. Absolutely. I, the prophylaxis should be for the duration of that surgery, which often requires one dose. If it's prolonged surgery, it may require two dose. There is very little prophylaxis that requires treatment to go on for more than 24 hours, yet we often see that in hospitals. That's no longer prophylaxis, that's therapy. And sometimes 50% of prescribing in a hospital can be prophylaxis. So the longer you go, the more likely you are to get resistance. And what, what about when you're treating, you know, some condition, some, you know, you're treating uh, children with acne or you know, people with acne and you're, with long-term tetracyclines, or it wouldn't be children in this case, but, um, or say somebody with, uh, which, who seems to have a chronic infected prostatitis and you're putting them on, say, six weeks of antibiotics. Is that indicated or is that just... Well, th those are two different things. I, I think it's, it's often a balance, I must admit. I, I personally worry about those prolonged courses of tetracyclines because there is going to be an ecological effect without a doubt. But I think one of the issues we've really got to here is that we can be patient advocates and we can be society advocates and we've got to balance the two. And I think too often people are patient advocates and will give very prolonged courses when often when they ask about it, they don't really, they're not really sure that they're justified. So I think we really have to question ourselves and ensure monotherapy. But most people use monotherapy, aren't, aren't they, these days? In general practice, I think that's probably the case, yes. But not to multiply the drugs in, in, the, hospital, mm. in the hospital situation. Well, Norman, we often get, uh, we see in community practice, um, uh, an amoxicillin or an amoxicillin clavulanic acid with roxithromycin for, for a um, respiratory tract infection. Uh, uh, Gary, can I ask you, uh, in, in nursing homes, our experience is there uh, a very high percentage of, of women particularly are on um, uh, cranberry extract tablets uh, for the prevention of urinary tract infections. Have you got a comment on that? Is that reasonable therapy? I personally uh, find that difficult in a nursing home. I think that usually the patients are on so many medications, the nursing staff are struggling to, to give cranberry. Uh, I think we can do better than that. They're probably crushing it up in cranberry juice just to give you the horrors, uh, John. Yeah, well, uh, there are dose administration aids that lots of uh, yeah. nursing homes are using. So from a compliance or adherence point of view, I, I guess it's not that bad. But you're right. I mean, uh, most nursing home residents are taking multiple medications. So another one just adds to that, uh, that drug load. There have been a couple of studies recently. One suggested that there was a benefit of the tablet form, and a subsequent study suggested that there was no benefit. So I think the evidence is still out there. Mm. So what about route of administration, Tom? Is, uh, you know, you, there's a temptation that um, you've got an elderly person with a community-acquired pneumonia, you know, just a quick IV and then oral. Is, is there any evidence that IV is more effective than oral, IM? Uh, there What's are this? occasions where intravenous therapy clearly gets to the site of action faster in bigger doses. But I think there's also good evidence, if you take pneumonia, that if you can look at the patient's presentation and apply whatever score you use to assess their pneumonia, that there's a group that's predicted to do well and can be treated with oral antibiotics at home. So yes, you may do marginally better with intravenous therapy, but probably not. But then there's also patients who clearly need hospital admission and they benefit from intravenous therapy. So again, it's applying our clinical know-how to assess that patient. There's also the issue, Tom, though, of changing over from IV to oral when you can. Absolutely. 
And the other thing to say in the same... But does that have any impact on resistance development? No, well, again, depending which context we're talking about, generally speaking, I don't think so. The point to make is that intravenous therapy has the attendant risks of complications like Lyme sepsis. And there are a number of oral antibiotics that get the same systemic levels as IV therapy. So when you have to use oral therapy, metronidazole orally is as good as IV. That's just one example. Many others. We've had a question come in from Toowoomba, from one of our um, web viewers in Toowoomba, Gary, asking, how, what's the best way, do we know what the best way of dealing with somebody who is demanding antibiotics, but you don't think they need them? Obviously a sensible discussion with that patient. I, I go about it with a risk versus benefit analysis and explain that even in their body, this idea of gut flora resistance is emerging with the prescribing of an antibiotic, let alone the concerns of side effects and allergy development. And so it's really up to the GP to explain, depending on the infection, the severity of the infection, the type of patient, maybe there may be circumstances, a, a diabetic patient, one may be persuaded more. Uh, there are, it's, you've got to be careful in making a generalised statement, but I think it's an explanation. I find that a simple explanation to patients of the risk versus the benefits and the ability to contact me if their infection is changing or worsening is the best way to go about it. John, do we still have antibiotic creams on the market? We do, and I, I was going to ask uh, uh, Tom and Gary about uh, whether there's any uh, relevance. I mean, we talked about acne earlier and whether maybe uh, you mentioned yourself, uh, Norman, um, long-term tetracycline use, whether it would be more appropriate perhaps to use a, a, um, an ointment or a cream uh, specifically tailored. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, erythromycin and clindamycin creams for acne, but there's also um, the uh, the other antibiotic uh, creams and ointments too, which are still used, still prescribed. So have you got a staph skin infection? Is there any indication for topical antibiotics? No, I don't believe so. There's, there is an indication to sometimes decolonise patients if you're trying to reduce their carriage. For so that's the nasal? nasal bactroban or, or mupir uh, mupiracin. So, so it's not really antibiotics that you're getting? Well, it is an antibiotic, but it's, it's a, a topical one, yeah. and that's sometimes used. But as a general rule, we don't like using topical antibiotics very much. Um, we have a particular scenario in Australia now that anyone who gets cataract surgery gets days of quinolone um, topical uh, drops. It's a frightening scenario. Why are they getting it? I have no idea. Right. Is there any evidence that chloramphenicol drops do anything after eye surgery? Oh, this is quinolone, ciprofloxacin yeah. drops that people are starting to use, and I are think they? that's, that's right. a worry. But yes, these things can be used for 24 hours, but to go on for a day is, I'm not sure what it's achieving. Chloramycetin, even in eye infections, is not without its potential allergic developments, and so we need to be careful as GPs to make sure of the diagnosis of a bacterial So can you get your plastic anemia from eye drops? From chloramphenicol? Okay. We'll take that one on notice, shall we? <laughs> Just to scare the bejesus well, out of people. Well, clinical eye drops are now available with that prescription too, uh, directly from the pharmacist, and of course they are now much more widely used. The sulfacetamide, which was more commonly recommended by pharmacists, is rarely now recommended because of the, the um, much more accessible... I, I must admit, as a GP, I'm concerned about that. I, I've noticed that more lately, and if we're getting guidelines that tell us that bacterial conjunctivitis is this diagnosis clinically, is the pharmacist making a diagnosis of a bacterial conjunctivitis? How do you differentiate between viral, allergic, other forms of conjunctivitis? Mm. Look, I, I share your concern, Gary. I think uh, uh, pharmacists need to be um, uh, much more concerned about uh, assessing a particular eye problem and, and uh, uh, maybe the, uh, uh, the simple uh, uh, tear solutions or um, if it's an allergic uh, conjunctivitis, which is probably more common than bacterial or even viral, then, then uh, um, more appropriate products should be recommended. Because mm -hmm. in fact that's part of the problem in the developing world is you can buy antibiotics mm. over the counter. Exactly. And mm. Part of the problem too is that um, a lot of them are con counterfeit and um, they don't, you know, you're not getting the appropriate dose anyway. Or something different. You might get gentamicin when you thought it was amoxicillin. Mm. Let's go to a case, another case study. Steve's a fit 45-year-old. He presents to you, Gary, with a sore throat nasal discharge. He's been feeling a bit sick for three days. He's got a cough with some sputum. 
When you listen to his chest, it's clear his temperature is 37.6. This case is presenting so far as a viral upper respiratory tract infection. It may be lower, but it, it still sounds viral. However, there is the need for an obligatory history and, I believe, thorough examination. If you're going to convince a patient, I believe, that this is a viral infection, you need to thoroughly examine them so they are confident that you haven't just brushed this aside. And this is such a common presentation in general practice that uh, it, it is difficult sometimes to spend that time doing that, but it's a discipline we need to do. So we do need to examine the patient thoroughly. Having said that, this so far looks like a viral infection, and I then go into a spiel about, as I was saying before, risk versus benefit, why I think it's viral on my examination, what can be done to alleviate the symptoms. So he said he's a bit anal retentive, mm. and he's kept this morning sputum, and he opens this paper hanky and it's green. <laughs> Does that change your view? No, I, I then launch into another practice spiel that explains that uh, really evidence has now shown that when your white cells are trying to help you or defend this infection, there are a release of chemicals that break down that sputum and turn it green. So it does not necessarily mean bacterial infection like we perhaps used to think. And if you look in, when you look in his throat, there are some white flecks on his tonsils. That's not how you diagnose tonsillitis. Tonsillitis should have a fever, enlarged cervical lymphadenopathy, pus on the tonsils, red inflamed tonsils. You, you either have a bacterial tonsillitis or you have a viral infection. It's unusual you see the both in my experience. You may have a viral tonsillitis with it, but you've got to look at the big story. Right. So you, you reassure Steve um, and you, that he's likely to have a viral infection. And um, you, Steve, you say to, to go to the pharmacist for some over-the-counter medications. What are you going to recommend? He wants something. He's got to get back to work. He's really pressing you for something there. Well, first of all, on my desktop, I print out a... Uh, the NPS put out a nice symptomatic management pad. And, and I like that. I can tick what I... Patients, as you know, love to go out of the side of the surgery with a piece of paper in their hands and they take it to the pharmacist. Plus, they forget what you tell them. So by having this instructions talking about steam inhalations, nasal sprays, perhaps cough suppressants, perhaps analgesics, I believe is an aid. But of also, we also have a need, if there is concern, or we've had a patient who is quite anxious about the need of an antibiotic, to offer the ability for review. And I think uh, most GPs do that these days, especially with children. Look, I mean, it's interesting because um, of all the categories in, in community pharmacy, the cough and cold credit category would be one of, if not the largest, but interestingly enough... It, they don't it's, work. I was going to say, it, it's the category about which there is least satisfaction, and, and you've, uh, I guess, highlighted uh, the main reason for that. Uh, I th <laughs> the I think, simple uh, one, they don't work. Well, well, I think some of the products do, some, some right. do, but, but uh, there is little evidence about the, the benefit of, of lots of the products uh, we have, I must admit. Um, I, I guess in, in this case, um, I know Gary's taken a, a, a very thorough history, um, but one of the things I would ask Steve is, um, is he a smoker? And uh, maybe that's uh, contributing to some of the symptoms that he has. Mm. Um, I'd be thinking, he seems to have three, three um, areas of concern. One is his nose, which is, is, is running, apparently. He's, he's sniffling, he's sneezing, maybe he's got a bit of a cough, he's got a sore throat. Uh, Gary mentioned steam inhalations. I think the, the silent nasal sprays are very good. Um, if it's a post-nasal drip that's causing his cough, uh, then we can address that situation. There are um, uh, con uh, decongestants which may help if the nose is congested. Uh, there's um, capsaicin. Manica, manica honey, which probably doesn't do any harm either. Well, it depend, depends whether you spread it on toast or just your bread. But the, the there are, there's a capsaicin spray and an ipratropium spray for non-allergic rhinitis. I think for uh, cough mixtures, that, well, that's an area where there's not a lot of evidence, but uh, uh, something like bromhexane with pseudoephedrine, so the mucolytic with the decongestant, is, is something where, uh, certainly anecdotally, we've, we've had um, good... Um, uh, good response. The uh, the other thing is for the sore throat. Well, there's there's throat sprays, there's gargles, and there's lozenges, and they they're soothing. And if you can help relieve those symptoms, I think you've got to give the, your your patient realistic expectations in respect to these symptomatic treatments. Gary, there have been studies, randomised trials in children with otitis media, that um, where there's probably a fair degree of overprescribing of antibiotics in otitis media, mm. properly diagnosed otitis media. And there's been a trial showing 
that delayed prescriptions, you're giving a, giving a parent a prescription saying if it's not resolved in two days, fill in the prescription. Um, and with so showing some benefits with that. Is there any argument in somebody in Steve's situation to give them a script and say only fill it in if your symptoms persist beyond two, three, four, or five days? Do we know? Certainly there are some circumstances where one may be tempted to do that. I think in Steve's situation, assuming that he has access to medical care or the ability to come back to yourself, uh, under circumstances where he can be re-examined that I would tend to not do that. Patients tend to either incompletely finish the dose if they improve or they sometimes reserve Is that a bad thing? If they're better not finishing the dose? I mean... Well, if they've developed a, a secondary complication that you've given them advice on, it's not appropriate right. and uh, often they will reuse that antibiotic, I find, next time down the track. A child with a, an otitis media needs a little bit more attention and sure. there, there'll be circumstances if it's coming up but, a lot. But, but it's in, the whole idea of delayed, delayed prescribing is in play, if you like, and the question is, is it in play in a broader group of people than for which there's evidence? I think so, and I think the child is one area where there's some good evidence and also probably correct application. I don't think the adult knows so much, unless there's exceptional circumstances. So Steve recovers, but he comes back to see you two months later. He's had a persistent cough for two weeks, worsened in the last two days, a bit short of breath, a bit of pain on breathing, and he's got a temperature of 38. Obviously a much different uh, clinical scenario that I uh, would take just as seriously as the first presentation, but uh, I'm concerned that he may be developing a mnemonic consolidation. So again, a thorough history, detailed examination, chest x-ray to confirm that diagnosis and some probably some laboratory investigations. And then depending on the circumstances... So what laboratory investigations would you do? Blood cultures? I wouldn't do a blood culture, you know, in and where I practice in a city, I wouldn't do a blood culture, but I certainly would be doing white cell count and mycoplasmatitis in case it turns out to be that. If the history suggests a, an influenza leading up to that, perhaps some uh, nasal swab for PCR for influenza. If there's history that it's Legionella serology accordingly. So it depends on the, the history and the examination. And if it's a Saturday morning and you can't get an x-ray till Monday morning, um, would you empirically treat it? I would, I can get an x-ray, but I would empirically treat him with amoxicillin. Uh, I would... So amoxicillin would be the drug of choice? Yes. And again, therapeutic guidelines, there's a change there. We used to, it used to be that 500 milligrams TDS was appropriate. It has actually gone up to one gram TDS. And if there's concern that it's an atypical or mycoplasma, if it's a weekend like you're suggesting, I may what add may, What would make you think of that if it's not, if you haven't got a chest x-ray showing low burn pneumonia? Well, if it's clinically one-sided with pleuritic chest pain, it is probably a bacterial uh, pneumonia. Uh, if, it's, if the presentation is not as severe, and bilateral changes, perhaps not as toxic, I may be considering it's mycoplasma. It's a difficult situation clinically. but And if you went to see another GP two months ago and he got um, amoxicillin clavulanic acid for his upper respiratory tract infection, would that change your prescribing decision here two months later? Look, yeah, it, it makes it tough. I appreciate that. But I, it, I, again, I need to explain and educate and communicate that patient why. I think the risks of side effects with that antibiotic uh, are strong and again by having evidence that I can demonstrate to him of why I'm prescribing what I'm prescribing I find is adequate. Can I, can I make a comment there to, to help with that? Um, Augmentin's got a much lower dose of amoxicillin than your higher dose of amoxicillin and the reason the doses have gone up is because the strains of pneumococci, which is after all the most important bacterium to cover in pneumonia, are becoming more resistant, so we actually need higher doses of amoxicillin to treat them. So in fact your ordinary augmentin it probably isn't as good, a, as good a therapy as higher dose amoxicillin. Really? And what about side effects at that higher dose? No, actually the side effects of augmentin are a lot worse mm. than amoxicillin on its own, even at high dose. Really? Mm. So. You wouldn't be worried that he's got resistance if he's had a history of antibiotics in the last two months? I wouldn't be worried enough that I wouldn't uh, right. advance on what I was describing. Yeah. And how long would you put him on the amoxicillin for? Seven days. And what would you do when you came to the pharmacy, John? Well, we'd reinforce the, the doctor's directions. I think one of the things we, we would like... Uh, no, but what, what if it wasn't Gary and um, it was a 14-day course he'd been given? That's a, uh, a challenging question, Norman. Um, That's what I'm here to do. <laughs> apparently. Uh, the, um, 
I, I guess it, it, it uh, really it comes back to the communication between the community pharmacist and the general practitioner. I mean, in your pharmacy, do you ask what the antibiotics for? Uh, routinely? Not, not routinely, we don't. No. Well, what we do that ask, though, is what, what has the doctor told you uh, about your condition? What has the doctor told you about the medicine? How long has the doctor uh, indicated you should take this? What dose has he or she told you? Now, uh, some of that is on the prescription, but we like the, the, the patient to be able to understand that. We would provide them with consumer medicines information. And what if it contravenes the therapeutic guidelines? Uh, look, I, I guess um, in, in most cases pharmacists are not going to go against what the doctor uh, indicates. In our, in our pharmacy, we have such a good relationship with the local GPs, we would, be able, we would be able to call them and discuss the issue. If it was someone from out of town, the GP, uh, then look, I have to be honest and say by and large uh, we, we would generally d dispense as prescribed. Um, so I guess I'm admitting to, to a shortcoming in our practice. We, we should be more diligent in, in communicating with the doctors. Now Margaret, we, we're, you're going to come to antibiotic stewardship mm. in a moment, which is about hospital situation. Should there be more antibiotic stewardship in the, um, in the community? In the community? I, I mean, I really and it's only going to be the pharmacist who does it. That's right. I, I mean, I really do think that there, we need to be thinking about that. I mean, we've really been concentrating on antimicrobial stewardship in hospitals, but there obviously are um, opportunities out there in the community for um, antimicrobial stewardship, stewardship and what, what, as well. What, what you give out this, the, you've got a sheet here that you give out to people um, from the well, Pharmaceutical Society. That's right. The, the Pharmaceutical Society produces this leaflet. It's one of um, around about 80 um, we call them uh, fact sheets on a variety of topics and this one on antibiotics specifically talks about uh, antimicrobial resistance as well. Um, so together with the consumer medicines information, that antibiotic fact sheet, um, the NPS with, which we've mentioned already has a um, the common cold needs common sense uh, brochure which is, is relevant for respiratory tract infections uh, and I think this kind of information is really important to uh, uh, to, to increase community awareness of, of what is obviously a, a significant problem. We've got a question uh, coming from uh, Marissa in far north Queensland asking how would you manage uh, cystitis in a postmenopausal woman? I would uh, take a urine collection, I would uh, if she's referring to recurrent cystitis, that's another question. We'll but come to recurrent cystitis okay. in a moment. Uh, I would usually prescribe uh, trimethoprim for three days after a urine collection with a phone call in two and a half to three days. Recurrent cystitis in any woman? Recurrent cystitis needs a different approach. Uh, there are methods of trying to assist that. Uh, oestrogen creams can be effective. Uh, the use of, I, I'm not against the use of cranberry, but we are talking about probably... And what about premenopausal women with recurrent cystitis? Often I would use, uh, I give, an, if it's recurrent, I would look for a cause, of course, and, and do a urinary tract ultrasound looking for any structural abnormality. Also advice regarding intercourse uh, is important. And there is sometimes a need with recurrent UTIs to give a postcoital one-dose trimethoprim, and that is very effective. Right. Um, hospitals, Julie asks, uh, this is Julie Thompson, a pharmacist um, in Sydney, hospitals seem to be making strong gains towards judicious use of antimicrobials. What lobbying is occurring for PBS limits on supply quantities for antimicrobials to become relevant to modern thinking? Mm. I mean, trimethoprim would be a good example. You get seven yeah. tablets in a packet. Mm. Margaret, you get... I don't know of any lobbying that's occurring at all. Or any changes there. No. Let's go to our next case study, who is Diana who's 64, uh, suffers from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and has recurrent symptoms, productive cough for three months of the year. Her cough's recently worsened with coloured sputum, shortness of breath after exertion and she still smokes. Gary? Yeah, there's a number of issues here, isn't there? But uh, considering the topic we're discussing, uh, I would be obviously wanting, because it's an infective exacerbation of COPD, to be getting an infection under control, quick smart, to prevent further complications. In this case, I would again use amoxicillin 500 TDS for a week as 
per the guidelines. Mm. I can understand why we as GPs have pressure. We have pharmaceutical pressure to use amoxiclav. We have 15 to 20 per cent bit of lactamase producing H influenzas if, if that's a particular bug here. So we do have this pressure. We want this patient to improve, but we have got to stick with the evidence. And obviously in this patient, there's a number of other. And how long would you wait to see an improvement before you started wondering whether the amoxicillin was resistant? I'd like to review in about three days. Three days? Yeah. As quickly as that? Mm. Uh, sputum cultures here can be useful, but unfortunately there's such colonisation that they're not always reliable, that that's a causative organism too. Let's uh, quickly go through some questions here. Bruce, general practitioner, asks, um, at uh, James Cook University, um, during his MPH, he was, it was said that a mixed antibiotic such as uh, amoxiclav or cotramoxazole was preferable to monotherapy to pick up the outriders and decrease resistance. What are your thoughts, Tom? I think you should always go for the narrowest. I think that, that cr antibiotic creed is correct. And there's, all, there's multiple uh, organisms, but you don't always have to c uh, cover all of them. And again, in this situation, for example, we're particularly interested in treating pneumococcal infection. And if you don't cover Haemophilus or Moraxella in the first one or two days until you get your susceptibilities, the patient's not going to suffer to any great degree. I think we should stick to narrow spectrum wherever possible. But amoxicillin is not that narrow. It's I mean, all clavulanic acid adds is a bit of anti butylactamase isn't it? Well, it has much broader gram-negative cover, covers staphylococci. It, it is a broader antibiotic. Uh, amoxicillin right. is much narrower compared to that. The Gabrielle from Greater Southern Health Service wants to know, are there general messages we can give about criteria for changing from IV antibiotics to oral in rural hospitals, Margaret? Uh, Yes, there are criteria. Um, the um, and I guess probably the best place to look for those would be in the uh, antimicrobial stewardship for um, Australian hospitals uh, book. There's uh, certainly good information in there, and also in the therapeutic guidelines, there's information about um, uh, switching. Yes. Uh, uh, Greg, um, a pharmacist, asks of New South Wales, what proportion of resistance is due to poor hygiene? Do we? It's really spread that we're talking about with poor hygiene rather than resistance, isn't it? Yes, I believe so. So the pressure comes from antibiotics, poor hygiene allows it to December. go nuts. Yeah, the, in, the infection to spread, that's right, yeah. Bella in Queensland uh, asks, should it be mandatory for GPs to prescribe to the therapeutic guidelines? If it's well, the evidence, it's the evidence. <laughs> It's a difficult one, isn't it? Uh, we certainly, because of we have this right to prescribe, but responsibility to prescribe appropriately, we may find, as this problem continues, that we find we're under regulatory processes to have authority prescribing, and here we are in an era where that's tried to be improved with streamlining. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. It probably would be much wiser if GPs had to use therapeutic guidelines in their prescribing. Uh, it's, a, it's a general knowledgeable book, but we face in general practice quite particular circumstances sometimes where we feel we have to be given that autonomy to make a clinical decision. Marilyn, what are, what are the, 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 the everyday strategies that you should be using for prevention, you know, for infection control in general? In general, well, I think we can't go past starting with uh, good hand hygiene practices. So, good hi hand hygiene, uh, you know, before you eat or before you prepare food, um, after going to the toilet, um, at home, things remembering to do things like after changing babies' nappies, before uh, preparing uh, children's food. Uh, also, two things like uh, remembering to teach children good hand hygiene practices as well. Um, there's also other issues such as good cough etiquette. So for example, um, remembering to cover your face or to use tissues and dispose of tissues appropriately when they've been used. So just, you know, really good basic everyday hand hygiene and good, good hygiene that we're actually taught as children that sometimes I think we forget about doing. And the balance between spread via touch versus droplets? So you've coughed into your hand paper and hanky. then if you if you don't um, clean your hands afterwards, then of course you can transfer them. So, so there's good uh, there's good sort of uh, other ways of, of coughing, such as coughing under your arm rather than into your hands. But Is also that not going to make you vomit. I don't Sorry. think so. No. 
<laughs> no, but coughing away, away so that you don't mm. cough in your hands, especially right. when you're out and you can't yes. clean your hands. <laughs> the elbows the go. That's the right. In Glasgow it was the green sleeves, but obviously it's, oh, the, no, green, no, it's no. the green auxilla. No, so this is coughing. <laughs> And also, too, I think that, um, you know, during flu season, you know, not to stand in front of people if they're coughing and sneezing and to stand, you know, stand away from them. And if you're managing a facility, um, mm. it's punctilious cleaning. Absolutely. So, uh, again, you know, good hygiene practices. So uh, making sure that the, the staff uh, in, the, in the facility use good hand hygiene, that they know when they sh should be using it, that you'll have... Um, uh, alcoholic rub um, appropriately placed at point of care so that um, uh, healthcare workers don't have to walk away from the patients to, to be able to clean their hands. So there are lots of uh, ways that we can try to encourage healthcare workers to clean their hands at appropriate times. And there are various resources that we've got um, on the Rural Health Education Foundation website such as there's 10 modules for basic principles of infection control uh, management. There are infection control guidelines from the Commission and also the Aussie Implementation Guide and, uh, and Toolkit which will all be on our website. What's antibiotic stewardship? Uh, antibiotic stewardship is uh, an effort that's made by uh, uh, healthcare institutions such as uh, hospitals to optimise the use of antibiotics. So it's really about uh, the appropriate selection of antibiotics, it's the appropriate dose of antibiotics, it's the appropriate duration of antibiotics. And this is really to improve patient outcomes, um, ensure cost effective therapy and to reduce any adverse outcomes and that obviously includes um, side effects from the medicines but also the uh, development of resistance. So, so it's a concerted effort. Right, how, to give me how, you know, you, like, people watching this program are often running rural hospitals, often small facilities, few beds with a small ED, um, what, but they don't want to get resistance running in their hospital. Sure. And from what we've heard tonight, they could very quickly. Mm. So what's, what, is, what, are the, what happens with good antibiotic stewardship in practice? In, in, with good antibiotic stewardship in practice, we use guidelines to guide prescribing. Um, and uh, we have uh, a range of sort of strategies around um, restricting our antibiotic usage and requiring approval for usage. Uh, we have um, people, uh, the um, auditing people's um, prescribing or just reviewing people's prescribing and providing feedback when that prescribing is not appropriate. Um, and that involves obviously some uh, consultation with infectious diseases uh, physicians, um, particularly around the uh, approval systems um, and requiring approval from infectious diseases to prescribe. Uh, to be monitoring therapy and actually seeing what is used in the hospital and acting on that, providing feedback to the prescribers when we've monitored the therapy so that they can actually see are they prescribing well or not prescribing well. So and measurement? Feedback, yes. and when you're ten and for certain antibiotics, you might identify a control mechanism, which is you're not allowed to prescribe it unless you That's answer right. a few questions. And also, what we have in the, the Mind Me is about having the uh, the susceptibility testing done for the antibiotics. And what's the evidence, Tom, that antimicrobial stewardship makes a difference to resistance? Th there is uh, enough data coming out that it does make a difference. That you can reverse the trends. You can't quite eradicate them, but you can control things. And that's been shown internationally. I think one of the great benefits of the program, the antimicrobial stewardship, it's taken the issue out of individual doctors' hands to publicise good prescribing, but it's said this is actually an issue for the whole hospital that the administration has to take on. It's a quality issue, and somebody in the hospital has to drive it and support it. I, th I think that's very important. Otherwise, you're just putting out small bushfires but never succeeding. So Margaret, if you've inspired people to take up antibiotic stewardship in their local hospital, wherever they live in Australia, um, and the one they have some control over, what should they do? Where can they go to find out how? Um, the uh, Commission has a publication and it was on uh, antimicrobial stewardship and um, hospitals in Australia and it is um, a copy has been sent to all hospitals in Australia so they should actually all have one there it might be sitting on the general manager's desk but we'll have a link to it um, on and we have our, a link on, on our uh, on our website as well so you can download it from the website Look, thank you all very much indeed it's been fascinating what are your take-home messages for those watching Tom yeah, my take-home message I think would be that we should go from antibiotics 
as something that you use just in case you could have infection to something that you have to justify to use and not use unless you can actually justify to yourself that you've got an infection. Look, I must just ask two quick questions. I know we're running over, but there's two really good questions that have come in. Quick one. Frank, a Canberra GP, has experience with patients who are very unwell, say an elderly woman with suspected urosepsis or diverticulitis who will receive triple therapy on an empirical basis. Is this practice overused and does it promote resistance? People use ampicillin, gentamicin and flagell sometimes in gastrointestinal infections. I'm and not is sure that th indicated? It's okay Particularly for 24 hours. We're, it brings in a different issue. Gentamicin is something that we want to use for 24, 48 hours only because of its toxicity. So by that time we want to review if it's really appropriate. Um, again, it depends on the circumstance. I think that's a difficult question because I'm not quite sure what the okay. specific... And quickly, for, uh, Gary, Sandra uh, uh, asks, also from New South Wales, what's the recommended treatment for boils? The ideal treatment is surgical incision and drainage, assuming that there's no surrounding cellulitis, lymphadenitis, uh, lymphadenitis or lymphadenopathy in the child or the adult is not toxic. So no antibiotics? No antibiotics, no sir. And uh, Natalie, a pharmacist uh, from Victoria, asks what role do probiotics play in antibiotic use? I can't think of many situations where probiotics have been shown to be of great benefit. I'm trying to think of any. Preventing antibiotic diarrhoea? There's a little bit of evidence, but not much. Not much. And they don't prevent Clostridium difficile? No, there, there isn't uh, good data for it. Gary, what are your take home messages? Antibiotics are the only medicine that we prescribe that affects other people as well as the person who we prescribe it for. And we need to get back to fundamentals of quality use of medicine, appropriate prescribing, efficacious prescribing. And the only way to prescribe an antibiotic efficaciously is to try and restrict and restrain our prescribing. And we need to remember safety and risk versus benefits. And mine carries on from Gary's and that is we really need to act now if we're to preserve the miracle of antibiotics for our grandchildren and beyond. Marilyn? Well, you can't tell by looking at your hands whether or not you've got multi-resistant organisms on them or not. So clean them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess, Norman, uh, my message would be for um, community practitioners, whether they're doctors uh, and or pharmacists, to, to collaborate and community nurses as well. Uh, and that applies to uh, particularly rural hospitals where there wouldn't be a pharmacist on site, um, but it's often a community pharmacist in the area and they can utilise that pharmacist's expertise in, uh, in uh, antibiotic stewardship. I must ask the last question here because there's really good questions coming in the last <laughs> minute here. Any comments about the latest fashion to add antimicrobials to hand wash solutions and soaps? This comes from uh, Cathy, a general practitioner. I'm not sure where. I think it's counterproductive, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So this is like chlorhexidine, presumably, or? Uh... You don't need it for no. ordinary day-to-day -day hand washing. The soap is good enough. Is it? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. But in a hospital setting where we're trying to prevent the spread of staff from patient to patient where we're transferring it, adding alcoholic clear So when, when you've been to the bathroom and you wash your hands with soap and water, you remove enough of the bacteria to make a difference? Yes. Yeah. And you're not going around spreading mm. things. But mm. in a hospital setting, it's a slightly different scenario, especially as a healthcare, healthcare worker. Yeah. Right. I hope you've enjoyed the program on antibiotic resistance and infection control. We are grateful to the Australian Government Department of Health and Ageing for making the program possible and thanks to all our panel members for contributing their time and expertise. And thanks also to you for taking the time to watch and participate. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised tonight, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website. RHEF .com.au. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms to register for CPD points. I'm Norman Swan. I'll see you next time.